Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate and the Searle Funds at the Chicago Community Trust. Good evening y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Univision Chicago Primera Hora, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. The city rejects the permit for a metal shredding operation on the southeast side, what it could mean for the future of industry in Chicago. Benito Juarez High School was one of five CPS high schools whose entire student bodies were awarded free college tuition. We'll have a reaction. Chicago's Mexican neighborhoods weren't always Mexican. We talked with the author of a new book that investigates how those communities were formed. A new immersive exhibition showcases the work of artist Frida Kahlo. And so the fillings are going to be much like that of a Colombian punch cube. And just in time for Fat Tuesday, find out what happens when Poland's most famous pastry meets tropical Colombian, Colombian flavors. First off tonight, Chicago's Public Health Department recently rejected a permit for a metal shredding and recycling operation on the city's southeast side. Here's Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwitty on Chicago Tonight earlier this week on the department's decision. We found um, that in an already overburdened community, there were some increased risks to the environment, uh, to human health and quality of life, as well as a history of some problems with compliance with existing regulations. And so in that setting, we felt uh, the appropriate course was to not approve the permit. In the wake of that decision, environmental justice advocates say now is the time for the city and the industrial leaders to work together and meet the needs of both the community and corporations. Joining us now with more are Teresa Cordova, director of the Great Cities Institute of the University of Illinois Chicago, Erica Swiney Staley, executive director of Manufacturing Renaissance, and Gina Ramirez, an activist and Midwest Outreach Manager with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you all of you for joining us tonight. And I want to uh, start with you, Gina. You think the city should simply reject certain industries from operating inside the limits? I think the city needs to look specifically at the south and west sides of Chicago, which bear the brunt of the burden of pollution. And so, yes, I think that the city needs to take their time, do health impact analysis like they did for the southeast side, and really consider community input when making such huge decisions that impact the quality of life and quality of health of these residents. That is how, what do you think the permit denial indicates for the future of the industry on both the southeast side and the rest of Chicago? Well, it tells us we don't need or, or want dirty industry and that industry should not be concentrated. But this thing is very important that we start thinking about what is going to be uh, our policy towards manufacturing and what is our policy going to be around land use as it relates to manufacturing. Because part of what happened in this instance where the conditions were ripe for the denial to the extent that more and more of industry has been concentrated in an area that was already burdened and less and less industry um, and less and less zoning for industrial activity, including manufacturing activity, is available in other parts of the city. Erica, do you think the community resistance, like that presented with the general iron, makes those communities less attractive locations for other industries, even clean industries? Well, I hope not. I mean, I think in a big metropolitan area like Chicago, I mean, we obviously need we need uh, we need to make things. We need good jobs. We need uh, wealth building opportunities. And and this is why I think that this episode uh, and the, the the appropriate denial of the of the permit I think creates the conditions now for let's be proactive as a as a community as a city as you know as in industrial developers environmentalists to let's let's actually plan this out like let's let's and this is where the industrial policy idea i think is a really it's it's time has come um i think the city of chicago 
can now step into a leadership position to say, hey, let's let's figure out the right way to do industrial development um, that takes into the account um, the values of our communities, environmental issues, the need for education and training, um, such that folks who live in these communities can actually work in these advanced green technology um, industries that we might want to um, incentivize to to come to um, you know any. It, uh, any community in uh, in mm -hmm. Chicago. So I think this is an opportunity for us to do it the right way. Right, and there are industries that are doing things the right way. Are there any manufacturing or industrial operations in Chicago, Gina, that you believe are examples of good actors? Yeah, the Method plant in Pullman is always an example that the Southeast side uses um, and aspires to have in our backyard. Um, it's a, a good quality job doesn't have a lot of, you know, outputs that impact quality of life and, and human health. And so we really, you know, are a working class community. We pride ourselves on that and we do want jobs, but we don't want jobs at the expense of our health. And so it's important to have a seat at the table with communities when talking to industry, when they're making plans that impact future generations. We need community benefits in place and we need to realize the 21st century vision for the Southeast side. Teresa, going back with you, one of the reasons industry advocates offer for locating operations like this in residential areas is that low wage workers need to live close to their job. But your research indicated that that isn't how it works out. Can you tell us more about that? Well, in the case of the Southeast side, for example, the area that Gina is talking about, the majority of the workers in that area are not living in that area. So when we talk about uh, the presumed benefits of these kinds of industries uh, in, with respect to jobs, it isn't showing itself with, uh, for the, those people who live there. And in fact, it's, the data is also showing that people commute, the majority of people who work in that area commute relatively long distances to come to work in that area. So what you end up with is people having to deal with the health impacts without getting any of the employment impacts. You know, and I really appreciate the line of questioning and this whole conversation because one of the issues is this false juxtaposition and the false opposition between jobs and the environment or between jobs and public health. And I think it's false to assume that that we that that public health has to come has to has to be suffered uh, for, for jobs, right? Or the jobs come at the expense of public health. And I think it's important for us to be thinking about and have policies, as as Eric pointed out, that first of all, that change the kinds of jobs um, that are available, mm -hmm. um, but also provide opportunities for people to have those jobs. Erica, how can how can Chicago make the city a place manufacturers want to locate their businesses, but not create an environmental burden to communities? So. The first thing I'll always say in, in regards to how to uh, is is education and training. Um, we uh, we can't just rely on sort of you know just the entrepreneurial spirit, you know industrialists to come in with a great idea. We need to, and this is where the industrial planning is so critical. We need to to we know the what is sort of known as sort of industry 4.0 industries, um, the 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 industry sectors of the future, which especially now needs to anything we need uh, uh, any development moving forward has to be in context of some green new deal um climate change is 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 here and we need to um adjust our development priorities accordingly and so so that's why you know if we invest make investments in education and training for um across public schools from k through 12 um uh into uh, masters and phds to get people incentivize people to actually uh, uh learn the skills and get the education to be leaders in the stem fields especially as it relates to you know green technologies um manufacturing and engineering and then incentivize companies who are willing to update their technologies so such that they're cleaner and um less impactful on the environment in addition to actually making the products that go into things like wind turbines or or solar Solar panels, so or uh, mass transit systems. So we can make these choices. We can choose to go in this direction, but we have to. We have we to have, do the planning. 
We have less than 30 seconds, and uh, I want to go with Erica to take this last question regarding the advice that you would have for other communities uh, both seeking to avoid environmental uh, harmful industries operating in the area. We have less than 30 seconds. I would just advise to say, you know, this, let's work with your, uh, I mean, it's all about partnerships, you know, engaging with your local, um, the, the local municipality, uh, industry partners, local schools, local community groups, environmental groups, get at the table and say, this is what we need and, and, and make a case for why we want to use, let's say tax dollars to attract, you know, the kinds of uh, incentivize and subsidize the kinds of industries we want to see more of in our cities um, that, that is in line with our environmental needs and, and values. I want to thank all three of you for joining us today. This is a very interesting topic. Thank you for taking the time. Teresa Cordova, Erica and uh, Gina, um, Gina Ramirez and Erika Staley. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The entire student body of Benito Juarez was surprised with some very good news. On Tuesday, nonprofit organization Hope Chicago told students they were recipients of fully funded scholarships at their choice of 20 colleges, universities, and other education programs across Illinois. One parent of each student's family also qualifies for a scholarship. We spoke with Juarez High School's principal and senior Diego Garcia on what this announcement means to them. The number of students who have stopped me in the hall for one, um, just to acknowledge um, the enormity of the announcement, um, to ask me questions. Some of them are still in disbelief. They can't even imagine it. And students who didn't think that college or post-secondary was a pathway for them at this time are flooding um, our counseling suites um, or stopping the administrative team to ask if it's not too late for them to begin applying. Initially, I had applied to the schools that I had applied to and I told myself, okay, great, this is where it ends. You know, I'm gonna apply for scholarships, I'm gonna do all this, but this completely flipped that on its head. Um, Initially, I had also planned, you know, I'm going to go to school. What school am I going to go to? And then what can I, what job can I get to accommodate my studies, uh, to fund my books, technology, transportation. But now that we have full room and board, meal plan, all of that, uh, the plan has drastically changed to I'm going to dedicate my entire life to what I'm going to study. And I'm going to dedicate all my time and all my effort to that. Diego Garcia's mother, Maria Garcia, says she also plans to use the scholarship to resume her studies. And four other CPS high schools received the same news this week. Morgan Park, Al Raby, Johnson College Prep, and Farragut. Back with more Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Today, the Arch over 26th Street lets everyone who passes through know they are entering a largely Mexican enclave. But before it was rebranded as La Villita, it was a largely Czech neighborhood simply known as South Lawndale. And that population shift wasn't an accident. The story of how La Villita, or Little Village, and Chicago's other Mexican enclaves developed is the subject of a new book. It's called Making Mexican Chicago, From Post-War Settlement to the Age of Gentrification. And it walks the streets of the city's Mexican communities and explores the history of the forces that shaped them. Joining us now with more is the book's author, Mike Amesqua, who's also a history professor at Georgetown University. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to start with, well, getting to know what brought the first Mexican immigrants to Chicago and where did they settle? Alex, thank you. It's so great to be here with you today. Um, the first uh, immigrants uh, from Mexico to Chicago uh, came because of the kinds of industries that existed in the Midwest and in Chicago in particular, such as railroads uh, and the railroad network steel and steel plants in South Chicago, as well as meat packing and, and, uh, and the packing houses in the back of the yards. And many of these original uh, for, kind of first wave of Mexican immigrants settled in South Chicago. The book 
introduces us to a pivotal figure in Chicago's early Mexican immigrant community, a woman named Anita Villarreal. Can you tell us who she was? Absolutely. Anita Villarreal was a tremendous and really important figure in the shaping and building of Mexican Chicago. Um, like many Mexican immigrants, she uh, moved around with her family. Uh, she was born in Kansas uh, to Mexican immigrants' uh, parents, uh, and they uh, resettled in Chicago. So she grew up near Hull House in the near West Side community. Um, she was somebody that uh, uh, grew up attending Hull House and learning from uh, uh, the figures like uh, Jane Addams and other social reformers of the time. Um, like many Mexican-American families living in the 1940s and 50s in the near west side, um, Anita was uh, already uh, had a large family of her own and was displaced by urban renewal, uh, this, uh, this moment in which the federal government um, provided funding for the redevelopment of uh, American cities, mm -hmm. uh, many of the this much of this redevelopment um, came at the at the cost of communities of color that lived and settled in the core of, 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 of the central city, and so um, Anita was displaced along with a lot of other Mexican families, but at the same time she was somebody that was always looking for opportunities. Uh, to support her family and to also uh, make a profit. She was an early um, Latina real estate agent, one of the first in Chicago. Uh, she got her real estate license in the 1950s. And upon being displaced, she began to consider um, how she could grow her business in communities like Pilsen and South Lawndale. These were communities that, while we often think of them now as the mm -hmm. Mecca of Mexican Chicago, were not very Mexican. They were actually, as you said, um, uh, of, of Czech and Polish um, uh, character. The, there was a lot of Eastern European immigrants that lived and, and shaped these communities in a, in a time before Mexicans. But Anita began to buy and sell property in these neighborhoods. Right. Not only that, she also had the foresight to imagine what it would take to sell a home to a Mexican immigrant. And often that involved building up the commercial thoroughfare of 18th Street and 26th Street in ways that would be hospitable and familiar to Mexican immigrants so that they can buy their groceries, uh, buy their pan dulce. And in those ways, Anita came to shape Pilsen, but more importantly, La Villita, uh, by opening up neighborhoods right. and properties to represent the community. Mike, and, and I want to get to, to uh, more topics also, like the term wetback, which in Spanish translates to mojado, uh, making reference to the people using the river to get to the, U the United States, hence the word wetback. And this is considered a slur now, but for a time it was used commonly in the news and even by the government. In your book, you talk about how the use of that term represented a shift in attitudes towards Mexican immigrants. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And we have, we're short on time, Mike. Sure, uh, really quickly, uh, the shift uh, uh, was because prior to 1950s, Mexicans are coming in uh, as braceros, they're uh, coming in and, and the framing of their migration is because they are helping the United States with the shortage of manpower in the fields. Uh, but in the 1950s, with the height of the Cold War and uh, fears of immigration and communism, um, the word wetback became uh, much more utilized and weaponized mm -hmm. against Mexican immigrants. Uh, you alluded to the Operation Wetback of 1954, which is a mass deportation campaign Uh, that uh, initiated in California and made its way to Chicago. In the book, I detail how this affected Mexican-American communities and right. Mexican immigrants. Um, and one of the uh, pivotal uh, s s moments of this uh, deportation regime was that they used old uh, uh, warehouses near Midway Airport to cage Mexican immigrants and then to 
fly them out of Midway into uh, Mexico. Such, uh, such an interesting happened. topic, Mike, definitely. Yeah. And we would need like a whole hour to talk about everything Absolutely. that's on the book. It's, it's just so interesting. I want to thank you for your time and for joining us today. And obviously, I have a lot of questions here that I wanted to ask, but because of time, I couldn't get to them. Like exactly how did the book came about, if you can tell us in 15 seconds. Uh, just through stories from my mother about her own grandmother being born in Chicago, but then being deported. I grew up hearing these stories and uh, wanted to know why she was deported and why she lived in Chicago. So I wrote a book about the city that my grandmother would have lived in and enjoyed Amazing. had she been allowed to remain in the United States. Mike Amesqua, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, the book is called Making Mexican Chicago from Post-War Settlement to the Age of Gentrification. You can read an excerpt on our website. Up next, what happens when a beloved Polish pastry meets tropical Colombian flavors? Find out next. The last day before Lent has many names. Shrove Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. It's also known as Punchki Day, when Chicagoans prepare for Lent by indulging in as many of the traditional Polish jam-filled donuts as they can eat. A local couple has brought a tropical punch to Punchki with a unique food fusion concept. Producer Erika Gunderson visited the land of Colombia for the story. We're gonna grab our beautiful punchki just straight out of the oven. In the timeout market demo kitchen, married restaurateurs Cynthia Robio and Philippe Sabone are putting the finishing touches. Okay, so we're gonna make a nice little divot right in there. So where our filling's gonna go in. On their version of a Fat Tuesday tradition. Uh, it gets every little corner here. This is the guava coconut. They'll have a nice coconut shavings all around. The smell of punchki in the air is one of the first signs that spring is around the corner in Chicago. And while everyone loves the classic versions of these sweet treats, if you're looking for a little bit more of a tropical flavor this time of year, Colombia is the place. Polish desserts are not very, very sweet. Colombian are, but I came to realize that what we can do to go ahead and make sure that both of them are resonating with each other is add those tropical fillings like guava, pineapple, uh, wild berry, different things like that, especially caramel as well. It's, very, uh, it's a very big component in like what is Colombian uh, desserts. Houston native and nutritionist Robio moved to Chicago in 2019. She met Sabone, a self-trained chef, at a party. It was love at first sight, as Cynthia will probably tell you. Uh, I beg to differ. <laughs> Not long after their relationship blossomed, the pandemic hit. I got laid off from my job. Uh, we just both started cooking a lot from home, just like everybody else during the pandemic. The seed of their culinary collaboration was planted when Sabone added Colombian toppings to a Polish zapiekanka, a pizza-like snack. A thought that was just like, you know, this would be a really cool concept, the Polish-Colombian fusion. They named the new concept, what else? Palumbia. Starting with pop-ups, they began offering fusion foods like the empirogi, a combination of the Colombian empanada and the Polish pierogi. So what we've done is meld the two where the inside is gonna be much like a Colombian empanada, where you'll find that farmer's cheese, caramelized onion, uh, coffee braised short rib beef, and that potato in there. And the outside looks much like a pierogi. Now, two years and one new Colombian later, the restaurant is going strong inside the timeout market. And as pandemic restrictions begin to lift, Robio and Sabon say they're looking forward to seeing customers' faces when they pick up this year's punchki. I think the number one thing that we miss the most is to actually see people's reactions, right? We're hopeful for that and uh, hopeful to be also bringing Nicolas and have people <laughs> see Nicolas as well. For Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, this is Erica Denderson. That looks so good, doesn't it? Well, there's still time to get your hands on those paisa punchki. You'll find more on Colombia on our website. Frida Kahlo returns to Chicago, this time in a new immersive experience. The exhibit showcases the work of the influential Mexican-born artist in 360 degrees. Ahead of the exhibit's opening, we spoke with Carlos' grandniece and grand-great-grandniece. 
They say, unlike other exhibits, this experience depicts the Frida their family knew. Imagine you, 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 you see your family in, in, in the world, in the world. And, and, and my grandmother, I, I adore my grandmother, um, uh, Christina, and my mother, it, 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 I can't express it. I, it it's a, a, a real, I don't know, I was chilly. I, I, it's, it's, it's an honor to see my family in the world. They didn't mention, you know, the pain or the uh, whatever she's passing through. She was only bored. No, she she likes to tell jokes. She 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 likes to laugh. So that's our Frida, our our Frida family. No, yeah. <laughs> my aunt Frida. <laughs> you can see the full 40-minute production on Frida Kahlo at Lighthouse Art Space in Old Town. There's more information also on our website. Well, that's going to be our show for this weekend. Join us Monday night for our next virtual community conversation. Joanna Hernandez will moderate a discussion about Afro-Latino history and the nuances of multiracial identities. That is uh, Monday night at 8 p.m. RSVP at WTTW.com slash events. Don't forget also to tune in to Primera Hora on Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you. Next week on Latino Voices, Marisa Parra with CBS2 Chicago will be here in the host chair. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.